in my early weeks of ministry here, in early 2005, right after Dr. Scott's promotion, I, I had to make a hard choice. And my choice was to, to try and build my own faith and grow and be my own person in Christ. And periodically, in, at least in the first year or two, I included a lot of Dr. Scott's nitro pills as I was basically forming the foundations of, of my ministry in the pulpit. Many of these messages we call nitro pills brought me great comfort. And I'm going to explain for the new people, because some of you might be saying, what is a nitro pill <laughs> message? Well, if you've ever had a heart condition, or if you've known someone who's had a heart condition, they're, they're given, see a hand waving there, you get a little, little vial of nitro pills that if you ever get chest pain, you put it under your tongue. And Dr. Scott had had a heart attack in 1998. I became the custodian of the nitro pills. He said he wanted everyone to carry them on staff, but I was the only person that always had them on me. He never had to use them. But that became the label for these messages that, just like a nitro pill, when pain hits your chest, you put one under your tongue, the pain dissipates. Same thing with these messages. Um, a brilliant legacy um, that Dr. Scott left, and what I would call a leg up for anyone who is struggling today or at any time. Um, so before I take you to where I'm going to take you, let me just reference one thing. Um, Jesus, in delivering the Beatitudes, don't turn there because I'm not going there, but in, in the Beatitudes, Jesus speaks um, certain things that I think have been misunderstood or misinterpreted. One of them is, he says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And it's interesting because if you study that passage, you realize that you actually need a portion of the Old Testament to understand what he was saying in the new. Normally, you understand what is being said in the old by the unfolding of which appears in the new. Here, it's the reverse. What Jesus was quoting, what we've called a rima, which is something that's already been a, an expression or word or verse that already has been repeated in God's word, appears in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those, blessed are the meek, they, they shall inherit the earth. But what he was dealing with was a concept that is clearly understood in a psalm, and that psalm is Psalm 37, and that's where I take you today. You'll find, by the way, that what I've just referred to as that rima is uh, Psalm 37 and verse 11, but the meek shall inherit the earth. And if anybody cares to understand the real meaning of that, although that's not the meaning of my message, it's not even my message, but it's interesting that the first 11 verses will explain what exactly Jesus meant by using that verse in the Beatitudes, which I think we can glean a little bit if we clear up perhaps some meaning out of this psalm. This is not an easy psalm to outline, but we're going to try and, and, and do something with it. So let's read first. I'm only going to deal with the first 11 verses immediately. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord. He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth, and he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be, but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. I stop right there because I wish to explain some Hebrew here today, whether you like it or not, uh, my captive audience. See, this is part of, my, it's part of my dilemma, is that I've tried to quell down a little bit how much I use in the language here Sunday morning so that I'm free to do it somewhere else. 
Um, but at times, I need to write things out so you can see them. Even if you do not write or read Hebrew, I've got people here in the room who do, but even if you don't, I just want you to take note of something, and you can scribble down your own notes, and then if you want to go try and look it up, knock yourself out. So three times in verses 1, 7, and 8, we have the Hebrew for what is being translated by the King James, fret not thyself. And why I want you to take a look at this, and I will explain the relevancy of this wonderful but ambiguous language. We have here the negation, el, that is negating or a negative, and the word which the King James is translating, fret. So, not fret. I need to make something clear. I don't mind you making a secondary application. Sometimes we say somebody's fretting. They're, they're pouting, they're dead. That, but this is not what this word means. So very carefully, and I, you can look it up for yourself, to burn, to be kindled with anger, burning sensation, rage, or pain. And because of the nature of the language, we're looking at something. I better do this up on the board, otherwise I'm going to have people thinking, what? What's she talking about? Bear with me for a minute. You who do not do language, don't worry about it. We'll come back to you. The Hebrew functions like this. You've got the call, which is a simple action, and its counterpart, niffle, which would be a passive form, the passive of this simple action. And each, as you go through the verbal system, you've got, for example, the PL, which is an intensifier. Not sure that that's the way that's spelled. And in the passive form, this would be the active. So everything under here is active. And in the passive form, everything under here is passive. We've got pual. And so if you keep going through the verbal system, you're going to get down to our fret not is in something called the hit pail. And really, all that means, and in, in this case, it's hit pail, and these three times, it is imperfect. I'm going to explain why I'm going through this. The hit pail makes it reflexive. When it's reflexive, it means yourself. We have to add that in the English to say fret not thyself. I wish you could. Just for a minute, because so many of you have heard this message, you kind of wrap your mind into what fretting means. But I want you to think of being kindled with anger. Do not burn with anger. Think of it that way. Fretting is just, to me, the, the King James, the, the, the use of that word tends to connote, and even the messages being delivered by Dr. Scott or myself tend to connote just being plain old, you know, dissatisfied. We're talking about burning with anger, rage, deep pain. And because of the tense of this verb or this form, we know it is also, it is intensive, just like the PL. It's intensive. Uh, let me explain this for a minute. Uh, in English, we might say a simple action is something is, is broken. The cup is broken. PL, it is smashed to pieces, right? Intense, intensed, intensified. This is also intensified, but in a reflexive way. So you'd have to add yourself or himself, herself, whatever, and in the imperfect. So let me, let me set the, the, the record straight here of what this might mean. The imperfect is telling us that the instructions being given are do not yet let yourself get this way. Not someone who is already burning under the collar already, although the message can apply. but. And my grammar students will know what I'm talking about. In the imperfect, it makes it something like one should or one shall or one might. It means yet to happen because it's in the imperfect. So when you read this, I want you to be real careful. I don't care if you make a secondary application afterwards to the lessons you've heard for 30 plus years. But I want you to get this straight. This is a warning in advance. And I want you to attach it first and primarily, I am sorry, to the context of the message. He's saying, don't let yourself get kindled with anger, first verse, because of evildoers. 
So, you know, we can make a secondary application to other things going on in your life, which we will, but let's make the first one, which the psalmist was saying. Because of evildoers, neither be envious against the workers of iniquity. The second time in verse 7, and let's try and put some, to not be kindled with anger. Do, do not let yourself be kindled with anger because of him who prospereth in his way. Don't be burning inside because of somebody else's way, because of what they're doing, or because of what they're doing to you, or what they're doing out, out in the world, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. And lastly, in verse 8, fret not thyself, the same thing. Don't burn with anger in any wise to do evil. And it's, it's needful to make this first application, because without this, I'm sorry, you can actually bend this a little bit out of shape. So the whole context of this is we could sum it up and go, I could take you to the New Testament and the message is over. Paul says it in Ephesians 4 and 32, let all wrath and clamor and anger be put aside, forgiving one another, right? As Christ has forgiven you. But here we're talking about an express anger that occurs. Now listen, I don't know about you, but I've been angry. I'm angry a lot of times at a lot of things. I'm very angry of late, of, and I don't say that like I walk around angry all the time, as people will twist my words as well. But you know what I'm talking about. There's a burning anger of, you could be the person who is constantly, even to the smallest degree, always being wronged in some way or another. It's, you know, you get cheated out of money that should have come back to you, somebody's done you in, somebody said something, whatever it is. And I think we've all experienced that, yes? yes so I want that first application to be that. Afterwards, we can talk about fretting as in being down. We can, have, we can make many other applications. But the first one is exactly what the context talks about. These words are very precise. So the first thing I, wanna, I want you to write somewhere in the margin of your Bible is discovery. Because the word, the Hebrew word, Titehar is a discovery of our nature. It is our nature to be angry when we see wrong. If, if somebody's not angry when they see wrongdoing, there's something wrong with them, I think. It's our nature. And let's just put this in a current setting for a minute. When we see things in the world, mass shootings, people, you know, again, this week, it's every week now, and we have to think, there's something really wrong here. And you begin to get angry. What, what, what is happening to us? I want you to remember, this is, this is another way of understanding that God says, I will take care of these people. But you are to, you, if you call yourself my child, you are to overcome evil with good. And that is, I've got plenty of Bible to back that up. So the discovery of our nature here is that we are quickly consumed with uh, anger. And as I said, if you look carefully, it really does, verses 1, 7, and 8 tell you, for a purpose. The psalmist is, is describing this. Don't let yourself get burned up with anger because of these, these things that are happening. And in fact, the, verse 8, um, don't let yourself burn. Fret not thyself. It just seems to kind of tone it down. Don't be kindled with anger in any wise to do evil. In other words, because you're all wrapped up in that moment, don't let that moment overtake you. Now, Paul takes up on that subject in the New Testament. Jesus takes up on that subject in the New Testament. You read it here and you run the risk of saying, well, okay, well, in your own time, in your own time, go through this psalm and circle how many times wicked and evildoers and iniquity, and you'll find that God's basically saying, I'm going to take care of those people. I'm going to take care and I'm going to deal with them. You are not God and I am not God. It's not our duty to take care of those people. Our duty is to have the right relationship with him. And by the way, this is very uncharacteristic of me to deal with a message like this, to do it this way. But as I said, well, you'll see that as we go through this, there may be a few things that we can glean in a different light. So I've already talked to you about the concept of fretting. 
and the discovery of ourselves. The next thing then will be our need to depend, our dependence on God, which shifts from how do I stop being angry or kindled or wrapped up inside? And listen, I cannot, I cannot know what goes on in your life, but I know periodically I feel like I am victimized by certain things. I'm victimized by the system or I'm victimized by a set of people, and I have to remind myself. You know, I have a friend of mine who... Um, did something that maybe wasn't the wisest decision uh, a couple, maybe a week or two or three weeks ago, which has come back as an avalanche on this person with so much grief. Whatever they did, they did it, by the way, I think in a spirit of, um, of ignorance. They didn't do it in a spirit of evil. But it's essentially, after this event, um, it has created such pain in this person's life. Every person has kind of you know, they don't want to know this person, they don't want to have anything to do with this person. And it dawned on me that, that that's how we are naturally, not spiritually, that's how we are naturally. This is why when Jesus talked about the beam and the moat and he said, consider what's in your eye first, we tend to think, well, these are good little Bible stories, they, but they don't apply to me and they don't apply to you. Well, they certainly do when you consider the backdrop to this psalm. So let's talk about how we can deal with the burning anger, King James fretting. This makes it sound too poetic, too, it's too polished for me to say fret. Don't you think fret sounds like I was sitting, I was sitting on a stump eating a crumpet fretting, right? <laughs> Doesn't it sound like that? It doesn't sound like burning, ticked off, PO'd, you know, blood boiling, doesn't sound like that. So that's why I, after looking up the word, I just said, nah, that does not work for me. So the first thing is the dependence, and we get that dependence in verse 3. Verse 3 says, trust in the Lord and do good. Let me stop right there. Here's another form of verbs for you. All of the instruction I'm going to give you out of this are all different, different section here are all, these next verbs are all going to be in the imperative. So when you get an imperative in the Bible, it's essentially not saying, will you, could you, might you, but this do. So the first thing we're being told is trust in the Lord. And let me talk about this for a second, because there's an and, there's a conjunction there. Trust in the Lord and do good, and that is in contradistinction to doing evil. That's what I want you to think about. Not like do good, like, oh, now i got to go out and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good as opposed to doing evil. That's number one. Number two, this, um, this word for trust, we get those Hebrew words, three Hebrew words in the Old Testament that basically fill up our understanding of faith in the New Testament. Phonetically, hasa, in the Hebrew, hasa, to run to a shelter or to take refuge. Batach, that is to lean, lean on something, on a staff, lean on something for support, completely putting all your weight, and amen. We get our English word for amen, to stay to stand firmly, to be grounded, to take a position firmly rooted in. These three words in the Hebrew make up the one Greek word in the New Testament for faith, pistis, or pisteo, which unfortunately your King James is always being translated as belief or believe, which we've already discussed many, many, many messages. We're talking about this word, which has great connectivity to Amen, but the three Hebrew words that bring you to that point. So to trust, this word, is to lean, to batak, to lean on the Lord. So when we talk about how to get away from the burning anger, 
The first thing is the dependency on, on the Lord, to, to, to lean, to trust, which brings me to talk for a few seconds here about faith and the thing that I always take for granted because here's a congregation that's been taught about faith and what faith means. And we've got faith lessons, hundreds, if not thousands of them. And yet, this is not saying simply, uh, you know, just, just lean on God a little bit, but in, in, in the bigger picture, to faith that the Lord will be enough, that when these things happen, the Lord is sufficient, the Lord is strong enough. I know that sounds pretty crazy because, of course, the Lord is strong enough. But how many times have you had a problem where you didn't go to the Lord first? And please don't raise your hand because I'm not going to either. I'm guilty. It's so much easier, like I've told you, like who wants to be a millionaire? It's much easier to phone a friend and use the lifeline that way than it is to talk to God because, you know, somebody tangibly saying, oh, wow, really? Oh, it's much more interesting than talking to somebody who's not answering back, right? <laughs> Trust in the Lord. Lean and do good. I don't want you to forget this. This is, a, I think, a lot of times I hear people read this, trust in the Lord. They don't read the and, the conjunction, and do good. That's not going out and doing good deeds. That's as, a, that's as opposed to doing evil. So shall thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. So just think of this for a minute. If you lean on the Lord in a moment of great heat and anger and choler, it's, it's as if Psalm 23 comes to my mind. You will be led you will be fed, you will be shepherded. Just right there in that one verse, trusting in him will do that. And we know that he can lead us into green pastures and he can provide a table in the wilderness and he can do all that. And he can also take the issues that we have and help us to get uh, a little mental clarity. He's the one that's going to mete out. He's the one that's going to judge. He's the one that's going to deal with. So let's move from, from trusting that's the first one, trust in the Lord, leaning on the Lord, to the second thing that we are to do, which is in verse 5. It says, commit thy way unto the Lord. And I'll go to the second part of that in a minute. But commit thy way unto the Lord is another imperative. Not asking if you might. I want you to put these all down as a bullet point thing. Let's take a new page. Let's do this. Trust. That's number one. Number two, commit. And this word commit, if you look it up in a lexicon, is used in the Old Testament to roll the stone away off of the mouth of a well or rolling up a piece of clothing. So when we say commit thy way, um, think of, and your margin may actually read something like that. My margin says, roll thy way upon the Lord. Um, that's much better than commit, so let's put in brackets here, roll away. But it's to the Lord. It's not just rolled away in a drawer for you to pull out at some point when you get lonely and feel like you've got nothing else to talk about, right? Because we do that too. Um, in the New Testament, this rolling away is being referred to in 1 Peter as cast your cares upon him for it matters to him. He cares about you. Let me talk about this for a second because I think as many times as I've heard Dr. Scott preach on this and I've preached on this, I think I have never, and I'm not sure that he did, so I'll speak for myself, I've never succinctly put this into a crystallized form where you can say, yes, I can make the application. Yes, you can take all the words and all the emotions and wad them up and roll them up and say, here, Lord, take them. But much like my message on forgiveness, unless you keep going back to the Lord and saying, Lord, take it, and you really are ready to just keep, it's almost like playing ball that's going to rebound off the wall, unless you're really ready to keep going at that until one day you're no longer expecting to get it back, you're going to be walking around with this for a time. And I've, I've, I think I have mentally settled this for me. I've asked God, please help me to deal with this thing, and I commit it to you. I'm, I'm, I'm turning it all over to you. But you know what? The next day it's still there, and the next week it's still there, and whatever issues you may say, I may say, well, I committed it to the Lord, and I'm going to leave it there, but I'm still fussing with it. And if you know what I'm talking about, then you know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, 
don't worry, you will eventually. So um, what I'm saying, though, this is what, why I, I said I want to stop here for a minute, because it's so easy to, to make this a poetic, oh, just, just roll it off, just cast your cares. But the reality is when, when we are in the grips of something, it's a lot different. I'm thinking about at least a couple of individuals here in the ministry who I'm sure they've claimed this promise many times to roll their burden, and their burden has more to deal with addiction and things that are ruining their life. And yet we know the promise, we know what to do, but unless the person is diligent to keep going back and saying, no, I'm not going there, and I'm going to keep committing it back, I'm going to keep rolling it off, I'm going to keep casting it on you, you'll be back with that burden in no time. I'm telling you, it's the voice of experience. You'll be back with that burden in no time. And I don't even want to see the hands go up here because I know that almost every person in this sanctuary, if not directly, is indirectly affected by someone who has an addiction who knows exactly what I'm talking about. Now, the, the context of this is not about addiction, but the principle is there. And that's why I said you can make secondary applications. The principle is there. Anything that is hindering, anything that becomes, we're now talking about burning anger, but we could make it anything and say, this thing that needs to be taken away. Roll it off, commit it, but you've got to keep committing it. Don't think it's going to be a one-hit wonder. It's the same principle as the message on forgiveness. If you are trying to rid yourself of something that is consuming you, it may not be anger, which is the subject of this passage. And you can say whatever you want, but the same principle applies. Now listen to the rest of this. If you roll your way onto the Lord, and I want you to just kind of if there's something to circle right here, it's the thy, in commit thy way, roll. It's, it's yours, by the way. It's not somebody else's thy, it's your thy. And you know what your thy is. That's the key thing. You know, if, if, you, if you don't put flesh and blood on the Bible, if you don't make it something that's applicable to you, it's truly a waste of time. You know what your thy is. Whatever that is for you, Put that down right there, circle that die, and say that whatever that is for you, that's what you and the Lord got to deal with. That's, this, this is your, there's a couple of things we have to do. That's our homework, and then he does the rest. All right, the next one, and we're going through a, a few Ds here. So I'm going to use one of the words as delight. Delight thyself. And I'm using delight as not only number three in the list of things, but also as one of my Ds to help you remember there's a bullet point somewhere. Delight thyself also in the Lord. Again, this is another imperative. So all of these are imperatives. That's why I do grammar. It's not asking you, would you like, do you care for this? It's saying this do. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And this is a difficult one because especially for people who do not know too much about the Lord, they come into the church, maybe people who are not saved or don't know the Bible. How can you delight yourself in the Lord if you don't know who the Lord is? And how can you delight yourself in the Lord when all you're doing is walking around in misery and despair? How does that happen? And the first thing I'd say to you is, if the desire of your heart is to know the Lord and to get to know the Lord, then you spend time in this book getting to know how and who and why. And once you come to know how, who, and why, then you would find yourself delighting yourself in the Lord because you know that the Lord is gracious. He's merciful. He's all the attributes that you could paint. He's all powerful. He, he knows exactly in fact, I'm going to go so far as to say he's the only person, forgive me for anthropomorphizing, but he's the only person who will ever really get you, as in understand you. Even the people that are this close to you, your loved ones, husbands, wives, doesn't matter. You're still two individuals, maybe married for 50, 60, 70 years. But the only one who's ever going to really know you, get you, and love you exactly for what you are, the speck of dirt that you are, I speak for myself as well, is the Lord. Until you delight yourself 
also in the Lord and understand that no one will ever care for you. It's to sing a song. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus, how I found in him a friend so strong and true, right? Because no one ever cared for me like this. No one has ever cared for me. I can talk about a great love with Dr. Scott, which, which is on an earthly level is incredible, but no one's ever cared for me. Do you realize, I mean, forgive me for interrupting myself here, I can do that, <laughs> but do you realize that no matter how many times you fall down and you've messed up, he's let you get back up. He's let you not only get back up, he's picked you back up. And I think about that, I think about the most staggering thing because I've, I've, I've failed so many times in my life. I've not only failed before I met Dr. Scott, but I failed so many times in trying to be a good daughter uh, to the Lord, a good leader in the church. I've messed up in so many places that I think to myself, and he still lets me get up. That's the, by the way, that's the miracle of Christianity. He still lets you get up after you've messed up, and he says, come on, looking at an example, getting up and pointing in the right direction, famous words, he meets you, your one step, he meets you, ten, extends the hand, picks you back up, and you begin to walk again with him. Now, I've listen, if you haven't fallen away, or if you haven't fallen down, or if you haven't failed, this has no meaning. It has great meaning for me because I've failed so many times. And I'm not ashamed to stand here and tell you. The greatest testimony is that I'm standing in front of you today saying, the Lord really must love me, and the Lord really must love you, and must love this church. My goodness, for all of our faltering and all of our failures that have occurred in our lives. So let's get back to here what we're doing. Delight in the Lord. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. So a good way to say this is if you delight yourself in the Lord, the Lord will give you the Lord. If you're pursuing the Lord, let me do a New Testament thing for you here. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added, right, after. Same thing is going on right here. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. If your heart is set on the Lord, like some people saying, gosh, I really wish I had a better relationship with the Lord. Well, if that's truly what's in your heart, then the Lord will give you that desire. It doesn't come from you just sitting around and imagining what God's like. It begins with picking up this book and reading and listening to someone who's actually opening up God's word and having dialogue with him in your own closet time. That's your private time, your, your own time with God. So if this is in your heart, then the Lord will give you the desires of your heart. That's not to say the Lord wouldn't give you other things if they were according to his will. But specifically here, this is what's being said. All right, we're going to move to the next one, which maybe you have in your notes and maybe you don't. The next one is in verse 8, things we do. Cease from anger. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. And why, why do I add this in the number of things? Because it's almost like embedded in here is a recipe if you want to know how to get rid of the burning anger and you want to know what God's word says about it, just go down the list here. Trust, that is leaning and faithing in him, rolling off the burden, delighting in him, ceasing from anger. And why do I put this as number four? You'd say, shouldn't this go as number one? No. Because until you've come to trust the Lord, until you roll away and you keep rolling away this thing under the Lord and you delight yourself in him, you won't be able to cease from anger until you understand what may be anger that might be separating you from God or maybe separating you from other relationships. You ever meet a person who is so angry all the time that they're miserable to be around? Do you know anybody like that? I know a few of them. I avoid them. <laughs> you had both hands up up there. I avoid them. I just stay away. I don't want to be around people like, no, you try to help them out. Are you okay today? Huh, yeah, I'm okay. Leave me alone. <laughs> like, you know what? I'm sorry. I just asked a question. It'd be nice for someone to say, geez, thanks for asking, right? Instead, you get the bucket of proverbial gloom dumped on you. No, thank you. But cease from anger. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. 
And again, I'm going to repeat what I just said out of Ephesians 4 and 32 because Paul's saying the same thing. And you know, when Paul says it in the New Testament, he's adding some dimension to it. But if you want to go and read that fourth chapter, it makes it pretty clear why he's talking along the same lines as this psalm about understanding, okay, he says, be angry and sin not. But then he says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That's also been taken out of context. Here, very plainly, cease from anger. Well, how do I do that? Well, let's go back to the first three. Trust, commit, or roll away, and delight. And let's just say that before you get to number four, you may have to repeat one, two, and three over and over again. Like, one, two, three. I'm at four, and I'm still angry, and I'm still boiling over inside. Well, I'll go back to number one. Lord, I trust you. I'm going to put all this weight of mine, the thing I've been carrying around, I'm going to commit it to you. And I'm going to delight myself in the fact that, Lord, you know what's going on inside of me, so I'm going to make you the delight. And hopefully this other thing, go back to number one. All right, let's go down the list. There's, I'm using five today. There's probably more than that, but I'm using five. Um, rest, number seven. You're going to hate my translation. Rest in the Lord. And the reason why I said you're going to hate that is because rest in the Lord sounds like, okay, I can kick back now, right? Yeah, God, you got my back. I'm going to kick my feet up here, and right? That's not what the Hebrew says, just so you know. Um, it says to either be still or to be silent. In other words, after you've gone through one, two, and three, by four and five, you should be ready to keep, just keep silent. Be still. And, and, and I'll take another page out of another New Testament giant and say, be still. As God was saying, be still that, and know that I am God. Be still and know that God is going to enter in because he enters into all things. The messes you made and the ones you haven't, the ones you're responsible for and the ones you just happen to be a victim of. So when it says rest in the Lord, I have a margin in my Bible that says be silent to the Lord. So at some point, I'm sure it means you've done all the talking now. Now you wait for God to do the rest. And the, the second part of this is, and wait patiently for him. How many are good at that? <laughs> How many are good at waiting patiently for God to do something? Come on, don't lie. That's what I thought. Because, you know, that's the way we are. So this part of it, if you want to put another D somewhere, put down discipline. It's the discipline of reminding yourself daily that once you've gone through these five things, the Lord will go to work. I'll tell you what the Lord does, because it's embedded in here as well. But the discipline is to be silent, to be still after you've done all this. Really, having done all, therefore stand, to wait on the Lord and to wait patiently. And that is, I'm not quite sure I want to say enduringly, but we'll add enduringly. Not so sure it's patiently as in, you know, I'm sitting here and the elevator music's playing and I'm not disturbed at all. I'm not sure it's even that. But in fact, God will go to work immediately. You may not see God working immediately, but he'll go to work immediately. It takes you looking at this and understanding that... Um, if you want to know our next D, where deliverance begins. And here's where deliverance begins. This is, what, this is what the Lord will do. Let's go back into our verse here. Um, in verse 5, it says that, and he shall bring it to pass. Let's take a new page. King James, in verse 5, says, and he shall bring it to pass. Interesting that there's only one Hebrew um, word being used here. So there's a, there was a little liberty taken on behalf of the translators. And he, I, I'm adding the and, but he he will make or he will do. So let's say it this way. He will act or he will make. 
strange. I know it's Hebrew, all right? So the first thing the Lord is going to do, all the things I said before, those five things, that's us. Here's what the Lord will do. This is the Lord's part, okay? It says he will act or he will make. So in that verse 5 when it says, and he shall bring it to pass, that's on the tail end of you rolling off thy way unto the Lord and trusting also in him, and he will act. It means once you do that, even if you have to keep going back on a daily basis, day after day, week after week, the Lord will enter into that. The Lord will begin to, this, this word here is used to do, to make, to act, to enter in, to intervene. But it takes you making the first steps. It's like the person who my heart grieves for, who is so spiraled down into depression and addiction and the life is out of control, constantly angry at the world, and cannot understand that at some point you have got to leave all of that with the Lord and say, Lord, I, I'm helpless. And here I am. And I, be, I believe that when we, when we begin to do that, it's exactly what this verse says. He will act. He will, he will immediately begin to do. Now, the, the next one, this would be number one. The next one, number two, we find in verse 18. In verse 18, it says, The Lord knoweth the days of the upright. Now, the argument that somebody might say is, well, I'm not upright, and that's not a joke. The Lord knows the days of the upright. I haven't lived such a good life. I haven't been like these other people that profess to be so good. Well, they're liars. Do you know what an upright person is before the Lord? It's not someone who does this and does that or doesn't do that. It's someone who has committed their heart, committed themselves and I'll say it again, falteringly, because that's all we can do. These crocks of clay, maybe they were perfect before the fall, but they have been imperfect ever since. And I'm, this is not one of these, oh, just try your best. This is understanding what our frailty is. And the Lord knows our frailty and knows our frame. The Bible tells us abundantly. We don't need to be reminded of it, or maybe we do. But it says here, the Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. So let's talk about this. He, the Lord knoweth. The Lord knoweth. I wrote down just a key word here because I'm sure some of you might actually remember this. This is from that group of words. We've got the word yada, although this doesn't read yada, but it's from that same group of words. The Lord knows exactly where you're at. He knows how, how low you have gone. I mean, let's think back at some of the promises. Underneath, bottomless are the everlasting arms. Do you, really, do you really think that God would call you out from among others he did not call to basically just let you spin in darkness. I mean, I believe that there's discipline and there's, there is discipline that the Bible talks about that the Lord, whom he loves, he chases. But do you really think he called you out of darkness to let you just spin and spend the rest of your life trying to figure out if God is really here, if he's real, if he's left you? The Lord knoweth. And it's time for us to get this right. The days of the upright are you. I don't care how imperfect you see yourself. I don't care what background, because he doesn't care. The Lord knoweth the upright. It means that you could have been the worst son of a gun for 50 years of your life, and then God calls you out of darkness into his glorious light, and you are being changed, you are being metamorphosed, and you're still not as glorious as people would say, well, you should be like this or you should be like that. Those are the people looking at the container and looking at the past. He says, this I know. This is the container that I will inhabit. The Lord knoweth who are his. And go back to this, the days of the upright. That's you and that's me. It's like people saying what, about sainthood in the Bible. You know, to be a saint, you know, don't you have to not drink, not smoke, not cuss, not wear makeup, not look bad. No, no look bad, actually. <laughs> That's what you've got to do to be a saint, right? No. 
The same thing is here with this concept of the upright. Totally different. Now, can, could we be delivered from the traditions that make void the word of God? I find people even today still coming into the church and they're still bound by that. Number three of what the Lord does, you'll find in verse 23. It says, the steps of a man, good is added, are ordered by the Lord. And the word ordered is established. He establishes. The Lord establishes your steps. You know, I think about my journey of all the places I traveled before I met Dr. Scott, before I came west. And he and I would talk about this all the time. It was a great subject of discussion, why I came west. I'd like to tell you that I came west because I couldn't stand the winters on the east coast. The nor'easters were terrible. The Hurricanes. I mean, I lived, I lived both on both uh, north and southern parts of the coast, but that's not why I came west. And did I know why I was coming here when I came? No. Couldn't tell you. And yet, I look back and I know the Lord established those steps for me to come here. And so many other things when I look back. I look back at my life and I think the Lord established those steps. Now, I had the choice to not walk in them, You've got the choice to not walk in them. The Lord can lay a path for you, and you can decide to just do otherwise. That's free will. Now, did I know that the Lord was working? No. That's probably why I walked in the path, right? <laughs> but read this again. The steps of a man or a woman are ordered. They're established by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. So I want you to just think of that. And understand that no matter what else is going on with the five things that you do, here are the few things that God says he will do in his word, our promises to us, to help us along in our relationship with him. So he establishes our steps. Now, you either believe that, I'm sorry, you either believe that, you, you faith that, you claim that, or you don't. You either, you either come to the conclusion that either God is in control of your life, your mess, your disaster, the things you did, the things you didn't do, he's going to be in control. If you've committed, if you've rolled it all off and you've said, Lord, all of this, the things that I've done, the things that I've not done, the things that I've bleeped up and the things that I thought I was doing really good, which turns out were equally bleeped up, help me. Now, I don't know. I think maybe God maybe sits back for, what's, what's time in eternity? I don't know. There isn't. So he sits back, which could be a second or it could be, Eternity, right? He sits back and goes, okay, you want me to fix that? Huh, okay. Okay, let's go to work. And that's, that's the way it works. That, you know, that sounds really great. It sounds like, wow, God will fix everything. But I think along the way, the reality is if I've, if I've trusted him, if I've rolled off my burdens, if I've done all the things here, I think God begins to work and he enters in. He will establish my path. Let's go to the next one. Number four. Number four actually has a pretty big, it's probably the biggest thing in this psalm that, I, that gripped me. It says, for the Lord upholdeth him in his hand. The Lord upholdeth him in his hand. I have a translation of the first part of that which I'm actually, I'll get to in a second. So let's talk about this as it appears first. Um, the Lord upholdeth him in his hand, says to me, the possibility, no, the probability of me falling down. Do you know what I'm saying? I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell you, I wouldn't want to be listening to somebody who says, I've never fallen, I've never messed up. I want to hear somebody tell me they've messed up and they made their way back and how they made their way back wasn't by helping themselves but by the Lord helping them. They turned to the Lord and this is exactly what this says. For the Lord upholdeth him in his hand. That means that the Lord, I'm going to give you the translation now because I can't, there's no way around it. The Lord is the stay 
in his hand. And that word for the stay of is to lean, to lay, to rest, or to support. Now, I did a whole translation of this verse and what I found most interesting. Let me read all of verse 24. Though he fall, he should not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. My translation, though he fall, not cast headlong. That is to be hurled away. And immediately when I was reading that, I, there was a pictorial image in my mind of falling and being like just hurled out into utter darkness. And it says the Lord will not let that happen. Huge consolation for me. Huge. And for anyone who's ever felt like they've really let God down. Huge consolation. For the Lord is the stay of his hand. That means the Lord's got you. He's not going to let you be cast into utter darkness. And by the way, the though he fall, several of these I cataloged, either falling by accident, falling backward, and I, I use that as in backsliding, falling as in to prostrate oneself with earnest desire to get back, but seemingly feeling the sense of being disconnected. I don't know if you've ever felt that, being disconnected from God, like you, so there's... There's some disconnect here. I'm not connected anymore. Anybody ever felt like that? That's part of that. And the last one is to fail. So to fall or to fail. There's four meanings inside the word fall. So with all of that being said, the Lord's got you. It says, for Yahweh is the stay of his hand. He will have you in his hand. He will not let you fall. Uh, there's another psalm Psalm 73, 2, that says, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. But speaking and turning essentially to the Lord, the Lord is there. The Lord will carry you. The Lord will catch you. Again, I go back to underneath bottomless. If you're spinning out of orbit with all of this going on, the difficulty with this message, by the way, for me, well, I, I can tell you I needed this message. And I know many of you needed this message. You're walking around with stuff that's hindering your relationship. Forget about the sideways relationship. That's, that's, that's a secondary or a tertiary thing. Hindering your relationship with God because the things you're carrying around, the things that you harbor, specifically in this psalm, the deep plague of the soul actually begins to drive a wedge. Instead of coming to God and putting it off on him. I trust you, Lord. I'm going to commit it. I'm going to roll it all up in, in, a, in a word bag, and I'm here, Lord. I'm, I don't want it back. When, of course, tomorrow it may be back, but you go back again. You say, Lord, I'm, I'm giving it to you again. It's much like my garbage bag illustration, right? Take the trash to the curb, but you can't help it go back. Well, this one, it's not that you're going back. It's so deeply embedded in the fiber of your being that you cannot, you cannot rid yourself of it. You know, our biggest problem, I he I've heard this, for over 10 years, where I've traveled to different places, institutions and schools, where I've heard people say this very thing. We say we understand as Christians God's forgiveness and God's love to us, but who is the worst at understanding the concept of saying, I can't, the words, I can't forgive myself, or I'm having difficulty getting back up because my inner self, well, here's the deal. That's why you have to go back and commit it to him. This is not something that you fix and that you release on your own. You bring it to him. And whatever these, I said the first level is looking at the deep anger because of evildoers and things done against you. But now make a secondary level here, a secondary application. Whatever it is that brings a hindrance, go back and read these five things I've, I've itemized for you. And then look at the five things that we do and then God goes to work immediately. The four that I've listed, there's more in this psalm, but the four that I've listed minimally, that God goes to work immediately. Will it bring immediately, uh, immediate results? And will you feel uh, like you've just been delivered immediately? No. I'll be honest with you. There is no, anybody who tells you that they have an instant deliverance message and that you can get delivered immediately is a liar. 
It took me many years to get delivered from the hurts of the past of what people, other people did to me, which is, which is what birthed the message on forgiveness. This is exactly the same as that in the same respect. It may not go away immediately. Some of you dealing with boiling anger inside, injustices done against you, things that you feel you are helpless against, go back and reread. And the psalmist, it says a psalm of David, if David wrote this, and I say if he wrote this, there is wisdom in whoever wrote this because he says, I've been young and now I'm old. So whoever was writing this was writing from a perspective of lifelong experience to know. Oh, the context, of course, is that uh, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. But the context is a person who over the course of their life has seen what God has done and knows his fidelity to his word and to his people. Is this his word? Are you his people? Yes, sir. Well, then you can rest, and, and I say rest as in have a quiet soul. The last verse, the last passage of this is the end of that man is peace. Verse 37, you can leave here today with that type of peace saying, these are the steps I will take, and the five that I take, the Lord will meet me probably beyond my steps to bring me to a place of peace. The beginning of understanding about how God works with us is understanding we're not just sitting here, sitting on our, our hands, our hands behind our back, waiting for God like you're waiting for a bus that never comes, but actively faithing that God's word is true, is a salve for the soul, and a road map for us to understand God wants us to be with him in unity, with him in unity. And the only way to do that is to go through the steps again. Trust, commit, or roll, cease. Go through those steps, go through those steps, go through those steps, reread what I've said and recognize that the biggest problem we have a lot of times is, is we cannot understand how all this will really unfold, but God knows, and he goes to work. And I'm asking you to stand on that word, faith on it, and if you've been wrestling through something this week or this last month or even this last year, I want you to realize that, as I said, this is his word. You are his people. We have a right to stand on his word and say, he declared it to me, I claim it. And now you watch when he goes to work. He'll bring his word to pass, and you can amen that in Jesus' name. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.